Welcome to another episode of Monday Night Therapy. We're live on YouTube and all sorts of other social media platforms. You know, I don't, I set up Instagram, but I really don't know how Instagram works that well. Don't have a clue either, John. You know, it's, Beyond it's, uh, it's, it's hard to edit on your phone. I find that it's, it's too tiny for me. Yeah. What is it with these people that can like, they can, I suppose there's people that write their books on their phones. They do. I, I tell you what, my thumbs just are not that. I mean, I got opposable thumbs, but they're not very talented thumbs. Well, I usually talk to my phone, but you can't. Well, I you still got to do that. You still got to uh, do stuff with Instagram, and I just I don't know. If I figured it out, maybe I'd be more popular there. You know what? I I do have like twelve hundred followers on Instagram, and I barely have posted there, so. Maybe that's testament to how neat a guy I am or something. I don't know. Yeah. Everybody uh, wants to be like you, John. <laughs> you mean old and crusty and kind of fucked up? The, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You got, the, you got the you got the world right here. Right there. I I do. Linda Wilkins is with us. She's a regular. Good evening, John and Todd. How are you tonight? How are you, Todd? Well, I'm pretty good. Had a had a good weekend. I've made my uh, first old fashioned ever. Um, not as good as those that other people have made me. So I'm, I need practice. Um, but I'm uh, kind of like him. So I'm trying to get the hang of that. So yeah, Matt, Han- Matt Hansen says Instagram is stupid. You know, I, I think that there's some stuff on Instagram. I, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you a story. There is a young woman on Instagram that I follow who has cerebral palsy, and she's an, a disability advocate. And I like watching her because some days I don't want to get out of bed because my headache pain is bad and everything. And when I see her videos, I think if that young lady can go around the where she's going and do accessibility stuff and, and have the biggest smile in the world on her face, I can get my ass out of bed. So there is some, a little bit of use to some of these social media platforms. Sometimes uh, yeah. Linda says, uh, good. Jo- hey, John, good history video today. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Uh, hey, there, Grab that one by Matt Hansen. There you th- go. This one. Should we start with this? Well, I think we should that, you know, we can, we can restructure our, our schedule for tonight. I mean, some Man. people probably find it hard to believe that we actually do have a schedule, um, <laughs> but we do, we do, we try, we try hard. Um, so well, you War. gotta read, you gotta read the tweet. You gotta read the, or the, you gotta read the chat because people listen to us on a podcast. Matt Hansen says, Quite the civil war between Husker fans and Creighton fans on Twitter. Yeah, good. And I isn't that kind of weird? No, I mean, no, if, if no, you're, no, no. I mean, if you're a Jasker, aren't you kind of both? And then how does that separate itself? Jaskers have identity problems. They, they you, you're <laughs> one of the, this is good old backyard hate, just like. They have an Oregon between the beeves and the ducks and Iowa, Iowa between the clones and the hawks. That's something that Nebraska has missed out on, in Nebraska fans. You know, just good old, you know, urgh, hate. That's just so awesome. And, and who better to hate than a bunch of diva prima donnas that go to Creighton? Wow. You know, I mean, it's perfect. perfect. I'm sure that I'm sure that they are very nice people. Those oh, Creighton fans, John. There's nice people <laughs> everywhere. You know what my joke was about it? I wanted Creighton to win, Todd. Do you know I why? Know you're pulling for him. I know. Do you, do you know why? Do you know why? Because that means if Creighton made the Final Four. And because Nebraska beat them, that way Nebraska would be in the final three. It's a terrible yeah. joke. It's a terrible joke. I spent at least 45 seconds to 50 uh, to a minute on that joke. And, uh, you know, I, I, what a way to lose. I mean, literally, what a way to lose. I mean, you look, here's the thing. 
when they when Creighton fouled at the end, I tweeted, "Why did Creighton foul?" Because my thought was, okay, if they get called for a foul, because that's how things are going to go, they're going to put a guy in the line, and that's the game. And there you go. Like ten seconds later, bam, they call a foul. Should they have called that foul right there, Todd? Should they have? I am not entertaining that question because I have not been to a basketball game in the last 35 years where I understand what the hell a foul is and what it isn't. So I'm just, you know what, whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins. And that's the way it is. The hell with fouls, the hell with the referees. Here's the way to solve the problem. Let the players call the fouls. Oh, what? They do it. Hey, they do it out on the blacktop. Let them call the fouls. That, you know, I think that I think when you're playing on the blacktop, Todd, that those are not the ultra competitive human beings that are the same ones playing Division One basketball. And that would what? lead to many problems. Here's a, okay. Let me ask this in a different question. You remember the Super Bowl? Yeah. Okay, remember the penalty called at the end of the game? Yeah. Should they have called that then? Did they call that penalty in the first quarter? I, I don't know. I think they could call it on any time. I do think I think you that the, call it I any think time. I think that the the real thing is is that when the guy went up to shoot, the Creighton guy either grabbed him or he altered his shot and I think if you were going to be honest about it, you'd say it was a foul and they called it and they lost. And it was a really dumb foul. I guess, I guess, you know, you, the guy could have made the shot and then, uh, and then they would have lost anyway. So well, here's kind of my perspective on it, John. I didn't give a rat's ass who won the game. <laughs> wow. I don't like Creighton. I don't like Creighton. And what a more miserable way to lose a game <laughs> than that. <laughs> I mean, you know, you get you get you get blown out by 25 points, you know, you just you just do self-reflection for a little while and think, why do I live on this earth? And why, since I have this great opportunity to be a living, breathing human being, have I chosen the Creighton Blue Jays? But when you get beat like that, oh, my God, that that never goes away. Never. 35 years from now, all those people sitting over there in DJ's dugout are still going to be really, really hurt by that. And that's good. And it was it, it was their chance for their first ever Final Four. It's been a little bit nuts. And then, uh, you know, what else neat happened after that, Todd? You know what happened after that? Uh, I, I know. What? what Texas happened? had a 13 point lead and oh. they lost two. They did so Creighton, Creighton and Texas, the only way that day could have been better is if Iowa lost in something important. <laughs> well, they didn't, but, uh, no. <laughs> but you're right. No, you know, and, and I, I heard some kind of crazy thing that, you know, they're, they, they, uh, on ESPN's bracket game or whatever, there's like 2 million or some odd crazy number of brackets that were submitted. And there's like, 200 that had these four teams in the final four. How the hell does somebody pick these four teams to be in the final four? I, you know, this is crazy, but it is, it is. But I guess if, you know, if you have a lot of data points, the probability that somebody's going to have these things is, is somewhere. I mean, like me, when I fill out a bracket, I spend like three minutes on it and I just click stuff because Honestly, I should never win my own contest. So I purposely just go boom. And then I hope that see the key here is is if you pick the weird upsets, then you can be the guy that picked the weird upsets. Well, sure you and can. tell everybody about it. Exactly. That's what I try to do. So do you right. think do you think television ratings for next weekend for the final four? Because there's no blue bloods. There's only one team that's ever won a national championship in the in the Final Four, UConn. I think they've won, what, three or four. Do you think people are going to pay attention and watch those games because of the underdog stories? Or there's no, there's no other big, you know, giant killer. You know, there's no big blue bloods out there to knock off anymore. 
I don't know. I think that I guess the games have been incredible so far. So I, if you're going to watch them, you're going to watch them anyway. You know who worries about that kind of crap that, oh, there's going to be no ratings because the big teams aren't in it. Get it. Sports media people and people who are selling advertising. Well, I, I, that that wasn't my point. I'm just curious if people are going to tune in, you know, without one of the named schools in there, or at least, you know, a David versus Goliath matchup or something like that. I mean, the, I only, reason, the only reason I pay attention at all to March Madness are for the upsets, the buzzer beaters, you know, and if Nebraska gets in I, or if Iowa State gets in, you know, I'll pay attention to that. I mean, I had a rooting interest this year with Farley, Fairley Dickinson. You know, that's the team that I kind of followed there and, and what a ride that was for a couple games, you know. So anyway. Well, I missed it. Wait a minute. Charles Hellett says – I will watch the final for sure. So th yeah. there's there's me and him going to be watching the final. There you go. Todd. There you go. Let, you know what? Let's go. We're going to go through some of these. Living in Omaha, David Matney says, my wife says I am not allowed to ask this question. You have to choose between Bob Diaco or Scott Frost. <laughs> Easy for me. What? Well. Bob Diaco. Why? Huh? Because he's Why? not Scott Frost. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, I'd agree with you because you'd pay him a lot less. And, and Bob Diaco, <laughs> when he was at, when you, when he was at Nebraska, he only stole like $800,000 as opposed to the $40 million that the other guy stole from us. Well, uh, you know what? Bob Diaco only had one year at Nebraska. So we really don't know how bad he was. Well, he I think he's a position coach now, not a coordinator. Uh, that's probably true. But I'll tell you okay. what, I bet, he, I bet he still has good hair. Stephen Hubbard says, do you think Dylan Loyola is milking Nebraska too much? John, are you related to Don Johnson in Holdridge, Nebraska? No, it's John Stein. And uh, great job on your history of football videos. Keep them coming. I plan to, and thank you very much. But uh, do you want to take this, or do you think Dylan Royal is milking Nebraska too much, Todd? No. No. Well, let's get into the recruiting. We had the recruiting weekend. Yeah, a lot of five, you know, a lot of five and four stars on campus. Some people say maybe the biggest recruiting weekend ever. Um, I was at the ball game, uh, the baseball game Friday night when uh, Matt Rule was sitting down the third baseline and. There were a number of the recruits that were at the ball game, and there's a video that made its way around Twitter where uh, Dylan Rayola and um, oh, the kid from Ainsworth, um, can't think of his name, and somebody else. They were standing up up above the bleachers, you know, doing the "Go Big Red" chant. They were leading it, um, which you know that's got everybody all excited now. You know, um, Dylan Rayola. You know what? He's apparently a very good quarterback and he apparently has made connections with other players uh, such that there are those that would join him um, if he comes to Nebraska. So I hope he comes to Nebraska, but I am not, I'm not going to lose sleep over this. Um, you know, until the kid signs his name on the dotted line and uh, goes to class <laughs> a day um, you know, I, I, I quit drinking Kool-Aid in the middle of the Scott Frost era. Um, I, we get awful doggone excited about 17 and 18 year old young men that if they didn't have inordinate football skills, um, we'd probably think they were just punks, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I hope he comes. It'd be it'd be a coup for Nebraska to have him come to Nebraska. Uh, do I think he's milking Nebraska too much? No, I mean he does have relatives there. They is a legacy recruit. I, you know what? Right now, right now in Dylan Rayola's life is it 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 is like us. It is not football season. 
So you know that once football season or his final, what, senior year rolls around and his fall camp rolls around, that that'll be the end of everything. You know what I mean? That'll be end of visits. That'll be the end of talking to people. I'm sure we'll still hear <laughs> comments, but people will be reporting on what he does on the field hopefully and and you know i would hope that and you'd also might like to think that he would commit to somebody by then because generally i would guess that's how quarterbacks do it is they or a, a high profile guy like him is they come in and they go okay i should recruit like june and then i put my recruiting behind me and i can concentrate on my senior season because they still i do have to play one more year get through one year more year of high school I guess that's kind of a requirement to graduate high school so you can go on to college. Have they done away with that because of nil yet? Or? No, not yet. Not yet. They haven't? Though I did read I did read about this 18-year-old girl that's in high school in California that's playing soccer for Angel City, and she hasn't graduated from high school yet. So she practices with her professional soccer team, and then she goes to high school. And she's taking some classes remote and she's got like one or two in-person classes. She's, she's all bent because she can't go to prom because the angel city has a game that night. So she's kind of bummed about missing out on that senior experience. Wow. Number one draft pick in the NWSL draft. So really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Is there John, look at, what? look at, look at our, look at our message from Angelina Wilson. That is that's a, that's a scammer on Facebook. I think we've become a dating app. <laughs> We're a dating app. What did you put in that? What is that? A Manhattan? What no, is in that, old, Todd? It's an old fashioned. Old fashioned. What is in it? What goes in it? Well, bourbon and bourbon. Okay. Simple, simple syrup and bitters. And then you put. I couldn't twist my. I couldn't twist my orange peel. So I just tore orange peel and threw it in there. Okay, whatever. Well, let's move on. Okay, recruiting weekend. We had recruits show up. It was an unofficial visit for pretty much, I think, everybody. So they came in Nebraska. They got a tour and they left. And they're, you know, they they some of them went to the baseball game, uh, but pretty much they showed up. They said nice things to reporters. A lot. Some of them said that Nebraska has some of the best facilities coming. Yeah, like uh, the coaches. They like the coaching staff. You yeah, know, there's yeah. that running back. I, I think the one that's kind of intriguing is the running back from Mater D out in uh, Southern California, a four-star running back. Um, he sounds like he's, he's quite the player. So that'd be kind of cool. You know, right now, you know, there's a lot of guys that are going to take in as many opportunities as they can to see – uh, university campuses and you know what what else what else are you going to do on a weekend if you're a high school kid huh you know they don't cruise up and down the strip anymore they just hang out and you know play video games so take a trip go see Alabama I, yeah, go see I, I, yeah I would I mean if people wanted me to come to their school I certainly would be going all over the place see parts of the country I've never been to before spring practice Todd yeah. Anthony Grant, Anthony Grant has returned to the team or he's That's returned to thing. practice. Yeah. That, that, that means he must be going to class. <laughs> That's that's still a requirement too, isn't it? Yeah, I think you have to. Yeah. Yeah. But the biggest issue I think we can both agree on for spring practice right now is that there are crap load of linemen that have that are already gone and there doesn't seem to be really anybody talking about this. <sighs> Yeah, that was a number that was thrown out that was a little bit astonishing. There's only 15 linemen on the roster, offensive linemen. A couple of years ago, there were 25. You know, so they're down. They're down 10. Um, I think you know you you did a little research and you know have gave us the names: Ian uh, Borkacher, Noah uh, Stafersky, Brent Banks, Bo Shaler. Eli Simonson, Hunter Anthony, Michael Lynn, and Alex Kahn. The only two that had, you know, much playing time at all were Brett Banks and Hunter Anthony. Um, Hunter Anthony, uh, you know, really didn't live up to his billing last year. 
Um, I kind of like Brant Banks. I thought he was kind of a nasty ornery guy that, you know, filled in in different spots. But, you know, you got to have those bodies because practice is grueling. And, you know, for our offense to develop, and for it to, you know, be cohesive, you've got to have a lot of reps. And it's a lot easier to do a lot of reps when you can sub 25 guys in and out um, rather than than 15. So that is kind of concerning to me. I think they said there's four that will arrive this summer, um, you know, but shoot, they're freshmen, you know, and, and uh, they'll be green, so – well, add to that, uh, what am I understanding? Okay, we don't. Know, we've heard the coaches talk about what they're going to do for an offense, and that it's going to be run heavy. And I would think that if you're going to be run heavy, you're going to even need more offensive linemen, uh, just because they're going to be battering rams. I don't know. I guess yeah. The the whole thing where we have dropped quite a number of them, but we seem to have shit tons of skill players is. Uh, I, yeah, it's kind of that's yeah. kind of we have to be concerned about something because that's what we do. Well, you know, you you, you got to worry. You know, I mean, you're not a true Nebraska fan if you aren't worried about something. <laughs> uh, Matt Hansen says I'm excited to see Nebraska line up with a fullback. Why didn't this show up? I'm excited to see Nebraska line up with a fullback. You know what? I, I'll believe it when I see it. I'm not going to consider Nebraska having a fullback until I see a trap, until I see a <laughs> trap play run. Otherwise, you can stick an offensive lineman back there and and uh, put a put a four number on him and and call him a fullback. If they don't carry the ball on a trap, nah, I'm not. Ah, I'm grouchy. I'm grouchy. Okay, Dean Pryor. Dean Pryor says wins practice. Well, you missed it today, Dean. Uh, you better you better get there earlier tomorrow so you can get padded up and you're ready to go. I think they're oh. practicing in the mornings. Yeah, that's right. They were they were like early, early the first day, and then uh, oh, you know what? We're gonna take this one. Adam Michael Fellows says, "I think Nebraska can win the Big Ten West this year." Thoughts. Here, let me go. I, I did mix up some Kool-Aid in the refrigerator. Um, Does I'll it go, go with bourbon? It. I'll go get it so Adam can drink Kool-Aid vicariously through me. <laughs> um, well, I'm, my come thought on, on Adam. Come on, my, we, we did, this is what people do. It's the off season, Todd. My I, thought, I Adam. Understand. My thought, Adam, is that I mean the Big Ten West is anybody's. It's been anybody's. There's no juggernaut like Ohio State and Michigan. Uh, you know, if Penn State moved over. They probably move win it pretty much about every year at this point. But when you look at the the Big Ten West right now, I mean, I think you'd have to pick Wisconsin. And the reason why you'd have to pick Wisconsin is because they win it a lot more than everybody else. Not because of anything else, but listen, here's how this goes when you're doing media stuff and you're writing things. You try to look at the teams, and honestly, when you look at the teams, you're kind of like, okay, is nobody a clear-cut favorite? Then I pick the one that's usually going to win it because they usually have the better foundation and the better – you know, the better overall everything, despite the fact that they have completely replaced their coaching staff like Nebraska. Or what? You're forgetting Big West rule or Big Ten West rule number one. Which is? Who had a down year this year by their standards? <sighs> yeah, but they've had two in a row. No, they never have two in a row. <laughs> I think they're 2020 and 2000. Wait a minute, it's 2000. They're 2021 and their 2022 was pretty bad. They need to figure out what they're doing. I know the he has to put he has to get a defensive coordinator before Northwestern wins the Big Ten West again. No, 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 no. What? No, you're wrong one, wrong one. I'm talking about the one with the inept son that's the offensive coordinator. 
I get. Are is that who you're picking to win the Big Ten West? What? I'm not picking them. I'm just saying it's fate. <laughs> it's not fate. You're just being irritating. <laughs> I hate thinking it. I hate. Did thinking I? It. Did did uh, did did Iowa win the Big Ten West last year, Todd? No. Did they? Why? No, they didn't. We beat them. Come on, Jesus! No, I know we man. beat them. I just try to cleanse. I just try to cleanse things at the end of each season. I'm hanging on to that win against Iowa. You betcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Garrett Ritchie says. You guys going to be at the spring game would be cool to say hello. Yes, we are going to be at the spring game. Uh, we'll try to figure out some kind of logistical thing ahead of time if people want to find us somewhere. And uh, I don't, we'll, we'll see. I am not the, I, listen, I am a lousy planner for anything. I don't tell anybody where I'm going or what I'm doing ahead of time because then they expect me to like show up or something. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> If you don't see us at the spring game, rumor has it there could possibly be an outing at a baseball game. The, the, yeah, we'll try to do that too. We'll try to we'll try to get out. I'll try to get out more because I don't get out very much at all. Uh, oh, let me go back to messages. David Mapney says, "Has Todd bought John Springgate ticket yet? Where's the coordination meetup at?" We we have a range for spring game tickets. We have spring and, and game we will, tickets. We will we will figure out how we're going to do this. Uh, well, here comes in more football stuff. Ted Hilker says, "Do you guys think the new offense will resemble Tom Osborne's playbook?" Uh, no, I don't. No. I, why do you say no, Todd? Tom Osborne's playbook basically had five plays that you ran to the right and five you ran to the left from different formations. And most of them were option plays or traps. And with a running, with a run heavy quarterback, that's not going to happen. Not going to happen. He had some counters. Oh yeah. He had counters. He had too. some counters. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be more like what you watched in the NFL probably 15 years ago or, um, you know, with some kind of, variations you know somebody had mentioned in the comments earlier do we think or they're excited about seeing three tight ends it sounds to me with what i've heard from practice they've they've put a lot of plays in um with a with an offense with three with three tight ends and as coach satterfield said you know they call it a 13 offense and i okay three tight ends um those tight ends could be in multiple different places. You know, they might be next to the tackle. They might be split out. They might be in the backfield. They might, um, you know, overload one side, an unbalanced line, you know. But, um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I think I think that the biggest thing that's happened since Tom Osborne was a coach is that uh, the players are so much more athletic now. I mean, when you, when you look at – Go back to Tom Osborne's era when he was coaching and name me a defensive lineman that could run down a quarterback. Neil Smith. And, okay. But they were uncommon, right? Mm -hmm. We all knew Indomitian Sue had unbelievable. Randy Gregory. Randy Gregory resident of Rail when Tom Osborne was a ramp. And that's probably the point. The defensive linemen and everybody has gotten stronger, fat and faster and much more athletic since then. So it's very, you know, when you look at Tom Osborne, a lot of people will tell you uh, it's you're playing football in a phone booth. In other words, you've tightened everything's tight. It's not space. And more of the offenses now want to be in space because the players are that much more athletic and it's much more difficult to pull off plays like fullback traps and stuff like that. You know, especially Todd, I here's the thing I'll say, you say about the fullback trap and I, br I haven't brought this up for a while. Do you think that of these 10 scholarship linemen and the five walk-ons that we will we'll see guys can execute a trap play because they can pull? I uh, think that we will see, lineman pulling really i think we will I, you know i had forgotten about that that would be incredibly exciting 
Yeah, I think we will. I need, you know what I need to do? I need to write that on the board over here. The, you know, the yeah. board where I had last week where it was said Todd spring game ticket. I, I, I think write, Todd I says that Lyman will pull. <laughs> okay. Bank <laughs> on it. Put it well, up. Okay. Okay, we're gonna. I, you know, I haven't thought about that. That would be, I, you can do a lot of stuff with pulling linemen. Mm -hmm. They can go on a lot more beer runs for one. We could. <laughs> okay. We could. Okay. What else we got going on? Let's go back to some, uh, some, uh, some questions. Uh, let's see. Let's take Linda's. Linda Wilkins says Tom did not look good the other day with Matt and Trev. You know, I'd for what, 86, 87 years old. I mean, he's getting up there and we should be, you know, yep. we should be thankful for every day that we still have him because, uh, you know, he is still a Nebraska treasure. And I'm, I'm impressed. I'm impressed that he's still sharp. I mean, you know, yeah. there's, there's a lot of people that, you know, get to that age and they've slipped quite a bit. And, um, you know, Tom Osborne's an old guy. And, yeah, it is kind of sad to see. But I guess that's the way it is. Oh, we have some with uh, spring game ticket, spring game ticket. Ralph Davis says, will Harbaugh and Michigan do a three-peat on OSU? Yes. You think so? Yep. Why do you say that? Harbaugh's got their number. You think so? He's, he's got, gotten his he's, – he's stayed around long enough and he's got his crap together. Yeah, he's got them figured out. And, and Ohio State now – I mean, they're talking getting rid of Ryan Day because he can't beat Harbaugh. And that just puts more pressure on the situation. I, I think, um, I think, I think Harbaugh has turned the corner with Michigan. Well, Linda Wilkins again with the question, Todd, did you say that bourbon that had bourbon in it, your Manhattan or whatever the hell it is? Is that what it was? Yeah, no, it's an old fashioned. It's related to a Manhattan. <laughs> I, you know what? You know, this next month I'll be three years sober, and the further I get away from alcohol, the more less I remember about any of it. <laughs> I used to know all the cheapest brands of vodka out there, but uh, she not, says, "Have you ever tried the premium small batch by Kirkland?" No, I do not have a Costco membership. Um, I will have to ask my parents maybe to get me some small batch premium from. Uh, from Kurt, from from Costco, I'm I'm up for any. I tell you what, I I got a Sam's membership and I kind of like their scotch and I don't like scotch, but yeah. Dion's still asking about football practice. What's going on with football practice this week? No practice today, and then uh, James Dugall answers it with uh, Tuesday Thursday practice. Okay, is there anything else about football, Todd? Um. No, I I don't think so. Um, I think I think uh, anything that I know I've shared, <laughs> and I've made some stuff up too. <laughs> Just like GPT four, uh, Nebraska <laughs> baseball. Nebraska baseball came in to its first conference. Uh, series of the season and I have determined one thing about our baseball team Todd we have the most religious team in the Big Ten because they 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 don't want to show up to play baseball on Sunday uh, <laughs> that's a good one John yeah I I spent a minute and a half on that a game. minute and a half on that one yeah it's a, the Trayton joke was like 30 to 45 seconds this one was a minute and a half uh but Nebraska baseball won their first series with Illinois and their offense is doing well talk about their t tell us about their offense Todd yeah they, well, but I'll tell you what the offense is doing well but you know a lot of times you got to look a little bit deeper than the surface I mean you know, on Saturday, they had four home runs, two back-to-back -back home runs, back-to-back -back and then again back-to-back. -back. Um, 
Illinois out hit them on Saturday. Illinois had more hits than Nebraska. Nebraska had four home runs to Illinois' one. Um, the, the offense is still potent, but the offense left a lot of runners on base. They didn't execute with runners in scoring position. Um, there was not one time on in Sunday's game, for example, that Nebraska got a hit with runners in scoring position. And um, Illinois did like 80% of the time on Sunday when they had a, a runner in scoring position, they knocked him in. So, you know, sometimes you kind of got to dig below the surface a little bit. Uh, uh, Max Anderson, who had a brilliant weekend, you know, swinging the bat with home runs and, and you know, some exciting, exciting hits, but yet his average dropped, you know, about 20 points. Um, well, a little more than 20 points, actually. Um, Bryce Matthews, you know, he, he is still hitting above 400, but his average dropped quite a bit. So some of these guys are starting to cool off just a little bit. That being said, Nebraska still is a very dangerous offensive team. Friday, they looked great with Emmett Olson out there on the mound. Saturday, Jace Kaminska, he did not have his best day. He did not have his good stuff, but he was able to scrap and make it work and keep the game close. Uh, and the offense was there. The offense bailed out the pitching staff and the bullpen. My goodness gracious, the bullpen right. looked good all three games. So we kind of got a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde thing going on with, with uh, the pitching staff. You know, I'm kind of excited tomorrow they're going to start Will Walsh uh, against Northern Colorado, who Will Walsh pitched brilliant in relief against Creighton last week. So hopefully maybe he can prove himself. They, You're right, John. They do not have a person to go out and take the mound on Sundays. And um, what is what is the deal with that? Are you, who is it? Is it Michael Garza? He's. He's pitched well at times, and then like this last Sunday, not at all. No, he he had a good start against Omaha, but he had a horrible start against Nichols. Right. And then, okay, you know, this Sunday, yesterday, you know, he didn't, he wasn't great. Um, he struggled. You know, he he, he struggled. He he get up, he get ahead in a count, and then he'd lay a pitch, the fat pitch, and they would drill it. Um, you know, the Caleb Clark, the freshman kid from, from Canada, we haven't seen him pitch for a couple of weeks. Right. Uh, you know, he, they put him in there to be the, the starter, the Sunday starter the first weekend of the season, which, you know, that's a lot of pressure on a freshman, but um, you know, there are just some guys right now that can't, they, they, they're not challenging the hitters. You got to challenge the hitters. And you got to get ahead and count so you can you can throw the pitches you want to throw. And but then again, you, you you can't you can't leave them over the plate just to let them whack away at it. It was good to see Jake Buns have a good outing yesterday. He came in in relief and pitched two good innings. That was good. But, Bryce Matthews. I did you ever think? I mean, he's just bashing the ball all over the place. Yeah. Did you um, I, did you think he was going to be this good? He struck well, me as a guy that was okay the previous like two years, and now he's like boom. Well, Bryce Matthews is playing pretty good, and um, I don't think he's he's not a reliable shortstop. I think he's got a better position, but right now he's the best option that Nebraska right. has at shortstop. Um, you know, if he advances beyond college ball, they'll probably move him to second base, um, but. You know, he's he he had a good freshman year last year. You know, he had that sophomore slump. And, you know, I, I don't remember if you recall, John, but we were talking at one point in time how um, Nebraska did kind of a series of shows on their sports nightly talking to four um, athletes about mental health issues. And right. Bryce, Bryce Matthews was one of them that they interviewed. And I, I didn't hear that episode, but um yeah, you know, and and uh, so I think he's had some struggles. Okay, did you, did you pay attention to the rest of the Big Ten? Michigan, you know, sounded like they played real well. They swept a series. Indiana swept a series. Indiana uh, swept Ohio State. 
Ohio State. What the hell has happened to the Ohio State baseball program? Well, they got. I think they have a new coach this year. I don't hold me to that. I think they. I think yeah. Greg Beal's gone. Um, uh, Ohio State is zero and three. Penn State is zero and three, where they belong in the basement. Uh, Indiana, Michigan, three and zero. Michigan State and Nebraska are both two and one. Uh, let's see here. Minnesota has won five games now. So and Northwestern has won one overall. So yay for them. <laughs> yeah. All right. What's next on the docket? Is that it for baseball? We got to figure out Sunday. We got to figure out Sunday. That's what we've got to do. And right. Coach Coach Bolt, you know, he he spoke very strongly about that after the game yesterday. And uh, we, you know, they play North Dakota tomorrow, North Dakota State tomorrow. Then they go down to Texas and play uh, two games on Saturday against uh, uh, Texas A&M, Corpus Christi, and I think Abilene Christian maybe. Um, And then they've got another non-conference game against Kansas State the following Tuesday before they get back into Big Ten action. So hopefully they can get something figured out. I had a question. Illinois, where would they pick to finish in the Big Ten? Illinois was – it's picked to be number four, and and okay. and uh, they had Nebraska at number five. Right. Illinois, Illinois, good team. I mean, Nebraska beat a good team two games out of three. And we um, get Michigan. We get Michigan next in Ann Arbor for conference play. Yep, I think so. Yeah. Yep. Easter weekend. Softball. Yeah, softball had a good weekend. They swept Purdue. Um, three games. Won three games. Um, you know, Coach Ravel's got to move it in the right direction. They've, you know, they've already played almost 30 games, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, yeah, but uh, softball's playing well right now, so kudos to them. Okay. Do we have anything else for Husker sports? Oh, you know, I haven't paid any attention to other Husker sports. <laughs> I've got my hands full with baseball and softball. Linda again comes back with a question. Todd, what do you think the salary will reach in free agency for Shohei Atani? Uh, the I, don't, moon. I, the I moon. don't even know who that is. Oh, John, John, John. Um, he's, he's a player from Japan that plays for the California Angels. And uh, he pitches. He's a starting pitcher. And he also is a designated hitter. And he does both things very well. Um, yeah, I, Linda, I think I, I honestly have not paid attention to major league salaries for years. Um, I've kind of, it, it's just got to the point of ridiculous that, um, you know, who knows? I, and I will say this, he's, he's one of the most exciting players in baseball and, if people have an opportunity to get out and watch him play. Well, you know, here's the thing. Here's the crazy thing. Two of the very best players, if not the two best players in Major League Baseball today, both play for the Angels. And the Angels can't win squat. You got Mike Trout and you got Otani there. And and they can't – that team can't win. Um, I, do us a favor, Angels. Trade those guys to some teams that can win. Wow. Dion Pryor comes back with, we don't need linemen. We got a bunch of tight ends who can block, be the fastest line in history. Well, good point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Fred Sacco finally shows up and says, no single digit uniform numbers now. Is this a swipe at the former staff single digit <laughs> IQs? <laughs> What do you th- what do you think about that as a motivation, John? Where you've uh, pulled the single digit numbers, you know, theoretically that's uh, eighteen uniforms, since Nebraska gives you know the same number to two different guys on each side of the line. What what do you think about that as a motivation ploy? Rule did it at Temple, and he did it at Baylor. Well, here I'll, this is going to sound like a weird answer. I play video games. I think if you pay attention to my life, you know that I play a lot of video games. One of the things I never do in video games is like make my dress up my character. 
one of the things my kids always do is change how their character looks and they go try to get win all these different uniforms and different stuff like that. Maybe it's because I'm an IT. Maybe it's because my wife buys all my clothes. And then before I go anywhere, I look at her and say, is this okay? But I don't really, you know, the whole single digit number thing, it's got to be important to somebody. You know what I mean? I think it, from my understanding of talking to somebody else about it is that the single digit uh, numbers are cool. They're the coolest numbers. So everybody wants them. And therefore it would be an incentive for them to want to, you know, want to get those numbers so that I guess they can look decent. I don't remember the last time I even wore a tie. (sighs) I just and I'm sitting here and I'm sitting here in a robe for God's sakes. You know what? What am I supposed to say about that? I, you know, Nebraska's had one, but uh, you know, a big defensive lineman. It's wore a single digit number. But I'm thinking of someone else, some other team last year, where they had this monster defensive lineman wearing number nine, and it just didn't look right. It just, yeah, I don't know. But, you know, years ago, they used to have rules on – in fact, you know, even in the NFL, they had rules in the NFL where, you know, certain positions – it used to be a wide receiver had to have a number in the 80s. Wide receivers, you know, couldn't wear single digits or teens or 20s or anything like that. So, um, (laughs) so I don't know. I You know, if if, – I'll tell you what. If if the number – uh, having a, a single digit number is important to a number of players and that they're going to step up their game so they can get a single digit number. Okay. That's fine. Ralph Davis says Penn state does not put names on player uniforms. Is this good to support team play? Eh, I, you know what? That was a Joe Paterno thing. And Joe Paterno there was there 40 years. I mean, he was there for decades. Nebraska on their new baseball uniforms, their new uniforms they wear on Friday, they don't have the name on the back. That's the only one. The rest of them, they have their names on the back. I've never been I, big. I've never been big on names on the back. I don't know. You put this way, I think that there's two things at play here. Number one, that was a Joe Paterno thing that, that became a tradition for Penn State. And because of that, God help you if you break any tradition uh, you know, I don't know if it really does anything to do with support team play, but I'll tell you what it does do is really irritate the hell out of the media people who are sitting <laughs> up in the stands and they're trying to figure out who just made that tackle. You know, if you're Nebraska's press box or a lot of the press boxes, the announcer comes over the over the intercom or over the yeah intercom and he tells you after every play. You know, tackle made by number 45, blah, 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 gain of six yards. And they tell you what the, what is going on with the game. So that because when you look at where they're at in the press box, it's usually way up in the air and way away from the field. So, you know, when you get old like me, you're not, and maybe some of the other sports writers, you're not going to be able to look down on the field and see that number nine is a defensive lineman. But uh, having the names on the back, I think, is – I don't know. I think it's it, it's I like it because then I know what's going on and it's hard for me to it's a PA system, John. That's what Linda Wilkham says. Yes, you're right. It is a PA system, not an intercom. <laughs> I knew I was saying that wrong. The words wouldn't come. Uh Okay. Uh let's see. Somebody asked if Nebraska had a zero. I was going to bring that one up. Jacques Yant wore it last year. On yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, they don't use a zero. Charles Hullett again with the question. They don't use a zero in football, do they? Yes, as Todd said, it was Jacques Yant yet last year. Matt Hansen from earlier. Have you seen Dion in his cowboy hat? I have not seen that. It's. I I don't. You know. I don't think he pulled i guess i only glanced at it i you know again it's that fashion thing you know get a guy what is somebody gonna wear a robe on the sideline a good looking robe like this like a hugh hefner type robe huh huh then you well, then i'll be talking then we, then if any we, coach we, was gonna do that it would be dion i mean <laughs> 
I haven't seen Dion in the cowboy hat, but I'll bet he looked good in it. Dion Sanders is he's a sharp, he's a sharp he, dress he man. He'll he'll look he nifty in whatever he wears. Yeah, we, we, we he can look good while we beat the hell out of him. Uh oh my god, we still have nine minutes left, Todd. I just I I'm getting a little nervous though when we talk about sideline fashion. I do not want Matt Rule to look like Matt Rule's looked like in the last <laughs> You know, since I've been paying attention to Matt Rule, I don't like that sleeveless hoodie thingy, yucky looking. You mean the smock? The smock. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. am con kind of concerned about that too. And, and he's been in shorts lately, and I'm kind of like, I get it, but I don't know. Oh, get Fred's. Fred, Fred's got a good one there. Yeah. Fred, Fred Sacco comes in with, does your robe say Flying Salami Brothers is sponsored by Sidetracks on the back? No, but it should. By it God, should. I, should wor <laughs> I should work on this stuff. It should, Fred. That would be awesome. Linda comes back in with, uh, John, his was silk, not terry cloth. Just, <laughs> thanks for just beating me down there, Linda. Uh what else going on in the world? Spring practice, we covered that. Are you excited? Are you excited about the spring game, John? Yes, I am. I I, I am excited because I want to. I want to. I want to be around people that feel the same way I do. That are excited about Nebraska football. I know we tried to do this last year, and it was a major letdown. I think for everybody. I mean, the biggest cheer that I remember was for the punter. And it was kind of like, oh my God, what do we get into? And and I think um, <laughs> I think that this year, that you know, I am I'm excited to be around a bunch of Nebraska fans who want to be excited about Nebraska football again. And I think that's uh, that's the reason you go to the spring game. I realize we're going to analyze it to death, and it's going to be a glorified scrimmage. And people go, oh. whenever you get excited about it, people do that. They go, oh, it's just a glorified scrimmage. No, what it is is a good time. And, I mean, um, if you can't see it as a nice social event, that's the thing about the spring game, okay? That is different than the fall games where we get very serious and angry about who wins and loses. The spring game is a really nice social event for Nebraska fans, for people to show up and be around other people that uh, love Nebraska football and maybe even see people that probably are wearing blue and showed up to the wrong area and shouldn't even be there. Go root for your basketball team, you failures. You know, <laughs> you, I will have to say that – not wanting to go to the spring game last year, but being drugged to the spring game against my will. Um, I did find some things very interesting. And, you know, you and I both sat out in front of the stadium on the east side for a while. Um, you were there longer than I was, but, you know, talking with people. And I didn't realize, you know, there are people that extended families get together for the spring right. game and have for years. And, you know, for the majority of Nebraskans, you can't afford to buy a ticket to take a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a two-year-old, you know, to, to a football game. I mean, most Nebraskans, you know, cannot afford to do that. But at the spring game, you know, you certainly can. And, you know, you can go sit where there's space and those little ones can move around a little bit. Whereas, you know, when you're at a regular game in the fall, you know, by God, they better sit in their seats. Um, yeah. It's it's just a different atmosphere. And that really struck me. And, and you know, I think I told you this when I was walking across uh, the bridge from the baseball stadium. Um, you know, I parked over by the baseball stadium. I, I walked with a lady um, who runs the teammate program out in Gothenburg. And, you know, all these high school buses are parked over there in that lot outside the baseball stadium, and they all brought these teammate kids in. And, you know, yeah, it's not a real game, but right. it's the real Nebraska Cornhuskers. It's the yeah. real players. And so I, I guess I do kind of get that. Um, again, I'm, I'm only going this year because you've shamed me. And... <laughs> 
And so therefore, I, I mean, and you know, I got a phone after our podcast last week, I got a phone call from Trev Alberts and he's threatened to take my Nebraska card away from me if I don't come. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'll, I'll be there and, and I'll enjoy it. I'll enjoy it. Cause I'm going to watch grandpa, you know, just kind of basking in the glory with his grandkids there at a Nebraska game with him. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, if you talk to coaches, I think if you talk to a lot of football coaches, they'd say spring is their favorite time because they actually get a coach. And fall rolls around. Everybody is very serious about everything, and they have to not just coach. They have to deal with all sorts of media stuff, and they have to you know, prepare for the next opponent, and there's so much stuff that goes into it that, that – and I'm, they're still coaching, but in the spring they get a focus on coaching, which is why they're in coaching, is to teach young men. And if they're not in coaching for that reason, they're probably going to fail or they should go to the NFL. But in the fall, they're spending so much time not coaching, doing stuff like game planning and stuff like studying an opponent and things like that and dealing with all sorts of everything that goes on that it's not as much uh, fun for them. So. Yeah. Yeah, the spring game might, you know, yeah. I just need to get my ass up and drive down to Nebraska. And, yeah, I'm paper state go. a couple of extra days. Uh, Linda fun. Wilkins, Linda Wilkins again. Linda is just with the questions all the time. Were the fans excited to see two rock stars like you and John just sitting there? There was I one that re- was. I, <laughs> refresh my memory. Oh yeah, gal came right up to you. You know, you're on you're you're John Johnson from Coordination. Don't you remember that? We were sitting there watching the game and this gal just came up in the in the uh row in front of us and said she said, "Yeah, you're John Johnson from Coordination, aren't you?" So, that's the rock star treatment that that we get. So, didn't we sit out by the the little player statue and yeah. talk to some families out there for a while? Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah. We enjoyed it. Dion Pryor comes back with, so you're saying our baseball team No, sucks. our baseball team's good. They're going to be in the Big Ten tournament this year. They are going to finish in the top uh, three. I'll you think so? Yeah, I think so. What was I looking at the other day? One more thing about the baseball team before we go, because I was – who hit – we hit – let me calm down. Hmm. We have given up the fewest walks, I think, in the Big Ten. No way. Yeah, I believe so. If you I, now, here's the thing: if you people don't know this, you can't. The statistics are usually posted at the Big Ten site, and you can't rely on them because the the Big Ten cares so little about baseball. They don't keep their fucking statistics up to date, and they're usually wrong. But I was looking at it the other day, and I believe Nebraska has given up the fewest walks. But in terms of hit by pitch, they're number four. I can't believe we're not leading the nation in hit by pitch. Holy moly. Seems like we got to, every time a guy comes in from the bullpen, you got to plunk one. Yeah, it's that, that part has been weird. Uh, all right, we're, we're almost at, at, at our hour limit. Uh, is there any, let's see, Joel Tilson comes in at the end here. Any news about Nebraska's basketball coach, Ho- Hoiberg? Uh, no, nothing that I know of. Well, he's, I know had recruits, he's had some recruits on campus. Yeah, um, I know they're they're going after a lot of guys in the portal. Yeah, looking at some transfer players. I think uh, they have a shot to bring a few guys in. Looking for some shooters. One thing I would criticize Fred Hoiberg about is that I wish that he was more public. I wish that he was more of a face of the program. You know what I mean? And I guess that's just not him. On the other hand, I, I, I should have brought this up before. Would anybody care? Oh, I, I think if he was out there, but you know, Fred Hoiberg's Fred Hoiberg. He's a, he's yeah. a class act. Okay. Are we going to end with that? Yeah. We have to figure out what we're going to do for the spring game where we're going to, like, you know the area. God, I'm always carrying you, John. 
I'm always <laughs> carrying. Maybe we should just tell everybody we'll meet them over by the damn mammoth or whatever that. <laughs> what Archie? Archie? I think yes, and I believe it's a mastodon. But we'll look that up because it's important that you know the difference. Okay. In fact, we should have just an entire show one off season about mammoths and mastodons and why we should have them as a Nebraska live mascot. Okay, everyone, mark your calendars for that one. You will <laughs> wa not want to miss the exciting show with John and Todd talking about mammoths and mastodons. Maybe we could get an expert. Good night, Todd. Good night, John.